Lift them up high. Cheers to you guys. We've reached the end of the week. And it's time for Last Call, the final order cutoff show for comic books that are hitting final order cutoff this Monday, November 25th, 2019. Jack and Brian here with Simple Man's Comics, where we are amplifying your comic book collection through integrity and community. If you're new to this channel, consider subscribing. But we're going to roll right into it now with our first pick for final order cutoff, which is Skull Digger and Skeleton Boy number one. This comes from Dark Horse Comics. This actually comes up out of the Black Hammer universe. I guess it was teased in an encyclopedia Black Hammer one shot before, but this is a 12 issue miniseries. And what do we got to say about it, Jack? Well, yeah, the solicit talks about Spiral City finds itself trapped in a vicious cycle of crime, corruption, and violence. And with the heart of the city at stake, a vigilante rises in Skull Digger. However, the nefarious Grim Jim escapes from prison. Will Skull Digger and his ward, Skeleton Boy, be enough to save the Spiral City? You know, and this is the thing we talked about. Um, we've talked about Black Hammer and the Black Hammer universe several times on this channel. They have a very unique option contract where their option for both film and television. And it's for the Black Hammer universe as a whole, not the individual book Black Hammer. So it's interesting to see these spinoff books and series come out of this Black Hammer universe because there's almost unlimited potential what can become of these. Um, I will admit that this book itself is probably going to hit home mostly with people who are familiar with Black Hammer or who have been reading Black Hammer. Um, but I think because the solicit doesn't really reference a whole lot having to do with Black Hammer, that it, it could be pretty native to new comic book readers who want to, you know, pick the book up because maybe they're attracted to the kind of the content of this issue, um, maybe the cover art, something of that nature. So it'll be interesting to see whether this book s sticks with Black Hammer readers or whether it's really tr treated as an independent release. Right. Also, it's important to know this is going to have three different covers for it. You have that regular cover. There's a cover B by Diodato, but there's also a 1 in 10 FOC variant. So that's another thing to keep note of to make sure you get those orders in Monday night before 10 p.m. Batman 85. Here we have... That conclusion of City of Bane, the finale for Tom King's run. But this is going to have that regular Tony S. Daniel cover, as well as a gorgeous cardstock variant by Francesco Mattina. Right, and the solicit, obviously, you know, it, it hammers home that it's the end of City of Bane, and more importantly, the end of the Tom King run after 85 issues on Batman. But there's also some questions we need answered in this issue, right, Brian? Like, what's going to happen with Flashpoint Batman? Is he going to get vanquished back to his own universe? What's going to become of Gotham Girl now that she's betrayed everything she knows? How will the Bat family deal with the death of Alfred? And will Catwoman stick around? This important to note that this issue is also going to tie into that Batman and Catwoman series that Tom King will be taking over under that kind of like DC Black Label separate release that he's going to do to kind of finish up his originally intended story. Yeah, this is one of those things I'm glad to see Tom King's run, at least in my opinion, is going out on a high note. We've talked about this run since its inception over Rebirth. Talked about the good, talked about the bad, but I think overall it's been a good run. But I'm excited to see what happens. Yeah, me too. And I'm hopeful that it's going to end with a bang. And, I, you know, I don't have a ton of expectations for that Batman and Catwoman series, but it depends. If this issue really kind of leads us into it nicely and can kind of draw interest, I think that that could change a lot of people's opinions. Yeah, I wonder if they get married. Skipping on over to Marvel, we get a new Doctor Strange number one. Now, this is going to have a regular cover. There's a regular price variant. Then there is a 1 in 25, a 1 in 50, and a 1 in 100 incentive variant. Tell us more about this one, Jack. Well, this is Doctor Strange, Surgeon Supreme, and this book begs the question of, you know, Doctor Strange, he's, he's got powers, he can do so much with magic, but what if he took his magic and used it to heal his hands so that he could go back to being a surgeon by day 
but the Sorcerer Supreme by night. Um, this book is being advertised by Marvel and by its writer, Mark Wade as a kind of great introduction for those who don't typically read Dr. Strange. And I gotta be honest with you, Brian, I'm one of them. I don't really love the character. I've never really connected with the character. I, um, it's never... I'm kind of the same way, but at the same time, like every time they do a number one or kind of a reboot or this is a new jumping on point, I always give it the old college try. And then I'm like an issue or two in and it just kind of falls by the wayside. So I'm interested in this one, but I don't know if I'll stay with it. Just this week, we talked about Massive of the Multiverse number one hitting stores. We did a review of it on the Bolo Show. It was Jack's long term play, but here we have hitting Final Word Cutoff Monday. Issue number two. Right now we just see the one cover for it. And boy, is it a gorgeous one. Another one by in Lee. But Jack, tell us about this. Yeah, this one, uh, you know, we see the two He-Mans teaming up with Keldor. And uh, the solicit talks about they're going somewhere they haven't gone before. Space He-Man. Um, so don't know what to expect from this. But, you know, what? issue number one was a great read. Um, we talked about it from its like long-term investment standpoint with the first appearance of anti-He-Man. It, kind of, it, it had great cover art with In Hyuk Lee. We kind of had everything you could want from a new comic book. I expect the uh, quality of this book to continue into issue two. I'm very excited for this series. This is one I'll be picking up all six issues, putting the set together. Um, so... I, I you you mentioned it before we started recording. You know, I know this is your big pick, right? There's no bigger Masters Universe fan than you. So I think that uh, this is this will be a pick we'll be talking about uh, a book we'll be talking about for quite some time on this show and various other programs on the channel. Right, and talking about going into space, I think didn't they try to relaunch another He-Man cartoon and it kind of flopped and it was basically about He-Man in space. Yeah, so I wonder since we're dealing with the multiverse if that's the He-Man they're going to bring in. Either way, fantastic cover, great story, and it's hitting FOC Monday night. Now here's a book, seems to reboot quite often, but every time it does, it seems like it garners some fan response and some anticipation for it. And we're talking about Suicide Squad number one. You have a regular cover, you have a blank cover, then you also have a cardstock Francesco Matina cover. That's right. And don't forget the probably dozens of store exclusives <laughs> that we will see for this one. Anytime you have Harley Quinn featured in a book, there's always going to be stores producing exclusive covers. But this book is about Task Force X, more commonly these days known as Suicide Squad. Um, and, you know, this is a you, – you're right. This is a book that every time it gets rebooted, which it's been quite a few times in the last several years – it garners some attention right off the bat, and a lot of the times for good reason. Like the, the series have been pretty good to start. They have struggled to maintain as the series has gone on because the just the basic trope of the series, I believe, where you have villains forced to team together um, to try to earn some time off their sentences. Oftentimes characters die. Oftentimes characters betray the team. And that's sort of a kind of reoccurring story. And I think that DC has struggled to find a unique way to tell these stories. Now, one thing about this series that is a little unique, Brian, is the sheer multitude of new characters that will be appearing in this first issue. So if you're a first appearance fan, there's a good 10 of them for you or so that, that DC has already put out character designs for. But before you start getting excited and think that this is – the greatest introductory comic of all time. Could be canon you gotta remember, <laughs> Right. You got to remember what the concept of this book is. They're not going to kill Harley. They're not going to kill Deadshot. Um, that's, or if they do, it wouldn't stick. So the reality is I think a lot of these new characters are exactly what you said. They are created in order to die, to advance the story. Um, but yeah, they, all, they have, all come out wearing red shirts. Right. But when they have the amount of characters that they do, you know, you never know. It only takes one to stick, right, for it to be a uh, um, a solid first appearance. So yeah, it's a gamble for sure, you know, if you're sitting there looking, you know, like you're one of those people who want to pre-order multiple copies. But, you know, as far as a, something to read, 
I'm very interested in this because I know, hey, some of these people aren't going to make it. And that's going to make this story interesting. Yeah, and if you're looking to get this book and you want something to bide your time while you're waiting for it to release, check out that Suicide Squad animated movie from DC because that's probably one yeah. of their best ones ever. Fantastic. And it's actually R-rated. So Yeah. They could have just copied that animated film for the movie and they would have had a home run. Yeah. So we know Star Wars just currently ended with issue number 75. So here we have Star Wars number one. And you guessed it, it's going to have a bunch of different covers. It's also going to have a midnight release party. So make sure to check your LCS, see if they're participating in that. They're going to have premiere variants. One I like, besides that cover A, is there's an Empire Strikes Back variant. Just me, the reader, and fan of Empire Strikes Back. That's one I'll probably be ordering. But tell us a little bit more about this, Jack. Well, yeah, this series takes place in the period between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. So to put that into context, you're, you're getting the time period right when uh, Luke is learning that who he believed was his father is not his Lost father. His yeah, that, that Darth Vader is his father, and he's got to deal with that. Um, Han Solo has been captured by Boba Fett and is now in Carbonite. Um, and... It, you know, it seems like this. Marvel's going to use these series to kind of fill in the gaps between movies. Um, they can kind of tell stories that will add context to the movies. So I'm a Star Wars fan, and I'm kind of excited by this series. But you and I have talked about this before. We talked about this on our um, Back Issue Bolo video series where we talked about Star Wars back issues um, from the modern Marvel series. I, where we talked about... Star Wars back issues from the modern Marvel series. I think that we both are looking for more unique and kind of um, organic Marvel stories from Marvel rather than kind of these movie fill-in stories. But I think still this will connect with classic Star Wars fans. Right. You know, Marvel is one that's going to stick to marketability. And those original characters are ones that they, I guess – feel are always ones that people buy but i agree with you i'd like to see some uh venture into those other characters the lesser known characters and do series on those yeah expand the universe the way mandalorian is doing it on disney plus yeah. do original characters make new ones yeah yeah it's a whole it's a vast universe All right, Justice League 38, this is going to be the conclusion to the Doom War. If you haven't been reading this arc, I highly recommend you do it. So it's been a great story, but it does conclude the Doom War. It also ties right into that Hell Arisen or Hell Horizon that's coming out. We talked about last week on the FOC show. That actually got pushed back and is hitting FOC this week as well. So you're getting a two for here, Justice League number 38, as well as Hell Arisen number one. Lex Luthor is triumphant, Perpetua is back in power and ready to take on the multiverse, kind of to bend and twist the whole existence to suit Doom. Um, has the Justice League finally come up against a foe they cannot defeat? Perpetua is the mother of their universe, after all, and the original creator. In war, there can only be one winner, and it just may be Doom's turn to collect the spoils. And as you mentioned, this leads directly into Year of the Villain Hell Arisen number one. Um, Perpetua had a lot of attention on her um, earlier in the series and then kind of hasn't been talked about for a while. That was a popular back issue for a while, a popular first appearance. And it looks like um, we're going to come full circle with kind of her, you know, anytime Scott Snyder creates a character, there's always a reason. Um, so now we're seeing her kind of take her place in importance within this series. And it'll be interesting to see how this leads into Hell Arisen, which is also, you know, ties up the whole year of the villain story. Um, the whole kind of Batman who laughs infected stuff. It'll be really interesting to see um, and how well DC can kind of tie a knot on everything. And again, that's before Scott Snyder jumps in and gives us more Dark Knight's metal. So I don't think these characters are going away.
And of course, sticking with DC, we are getting that finale. I mean, we've been waiting, but it's here. We're talking about that finale to Doomsday Clock with Doomsday Clock number 12. It's got a regular cover as well as a regular price variant by Gary Frank. There's also a blank variant. I actually like the cover right on here. It's got like that Superman logo with the little Watchman blood in the top. But we're getting that showdown. What do you got to say, Jack? You know, this series, is it's been kind of tough to judge. I think um, I've listened to a lot of people be negative about it. And I think they're negative about it just from a release schedule yeah. standpoint. Um, the reality is the the quality of the series has been outstanding. Um, this is going to be one that I'm definitely going to pick up in, in a trade or a hardcover well, version. Oh, I, I without a doubt ha- need to reread this because every month when I read it, I feel like I have to kind of go back and look at previous issues. And I'm kind of tired of pulling them out of short boxes. But at the same point, um, I feel like, and this may be a dangerous statement because Watchmen is one of the most perfect comics there is, but I feel like this has lived up to the lore of Watchmen better than most series have, um, certainly better than the the various before Watchmen series did. Um, so I think Jeff Johns has done a great job with this. I, and I admit I'm a Jeff Johns fan. I, say, um, I love Jeff Johns. Yeah, I'm a big Jeff Johns fan. So, you know. I, I, and it's not that like he can do no wrong. I just like the way he writes stories. I feel like he, his stories are so emotionally driven. Um, he's kind of the perfect writer to write a Watchmen series. Um, but I'm excited for this. This is, you know, we, we don't know much about what's going to happen in this issue because DC is not going to give you a lot going into the, the final issue. All we know is this is the showdown between Superman and Dr. Manhattan. Getting back over into that smaller press, I have the Master of Universe pick, so it's only natural that Jack gets a Valiant pick in here. And we are talking about Visitor number one. This has five different covers for it, including that cover E, which is that one through six pre-order. So if what you pre-order that bundle, you get this cover for it, right, Jack? Yeah, yeah. You go to your LCS. Um, a lot of times they even have these little forms you can fill out um, that come directly from Valiant. Pre-order those first six issues and you can get exclusive variants um, that are only available to those who go ahead and commit to those first that first arc. Um, and a lot of times those are by far the lowest printed variants put out for a book. So we always want to kind of make you aware of that. That's kind of the point of the last call show. But this series, The Visitor, now you, that name may be familiar to you. There was previously a character in the 90s under Valiant Comics called The Visitor. But this is actually a new character. They just borrowed the name. And, uh, you know, the tagline for this book is untraceable, unstoppable, unkillable. So um, you're getting a character, kind of a cool character design, two guns up. Um, This is my kind of book, right? Uh, Street level hero. Um, I I kind of like the use of kind of more natural weaponry. Um, And this is written by Paul Levitz, who who has done Legion of Superheroes for DC. He's synonymous for his work with DC Comics. Um, And... This is part of Valiant's new program where they are going to do a new book every month, a new number one. They're trying to bring in new readers. They're trying to introduce characters to a new audience. And this is pretty cool because not only are they giving you a new jumping off point, they're giving you a first appearance, a new character. And it's it's not often we know going into a new series that this is for sure a first appearance. But Valiant has worked hard to make people know this is a brand new character that – this book is going to tell the story of this character. They're going to reveal who this character kind of is and, and what his deal is. So um, if you wanted to, if you're a Punisher fan or um, Deadpool, it kind of has that type of look to it as a book. Um, and you want to check out something within the Valiant universe, this is a great time to start. I'm telling you, Jack's going to have me reading a Valiant book here soon. Eventually, I'm going to get you with one. And again, it's another one of those ones where it's like, I'm not anti-Valiant. It's always about the amount of titles and stuff out there. It comes out of time and budget. But yes, definitely going to check one out. Might be this one. Never know. And the last book we're going to talk about this week is one we've been leading up to. Everyone knows how big I am on that Thor Jason Aaron run. Been loving it. But 
Mjolnir's been handed off. We now get Donny Cates writing it. And we have Thor number one. This is going to have a crap load of covers, as you might imagine. You're going to have regular covers and store exclusives from artists such as Nick Klein, Olivier Koipel, Ryan Stegman, Art Germ, Stanley Lau, Matea Scalera, Jack Kirby, Chris Anka, Lucio Perillo, Ron Lim, Mr. Garson, Ryan Brown, and Jen Bartel. My favorite it's got to be that Jack Kirby collage variant. But there's a bunch of other great ones too. Jack, I'm a Donny Cates fan, but I know you're a diehard Donny Cates fan. So tell us about this book. Well, here's the thing. Like, I am a diehard Donny Cates fan. I'm not a diehard Thor fan. I know you, you are. You watch your mouth. <laughs> right, I know you are. Um, I am a fan of Jason Aaron. I am a big Jason Aaron fan. And I've dabbled at times with reading Thor during his run. But it, it hasn't sustained me. But if there's one thing I know about Downey Cates, um, the one thing I'm sure of, he's going to build out this mythology, right? He's going to add his own flavor to it. We are going to see um, some world building, if you can even think that's possible after what's already been done by Jack Kirby, by um, by Simonson, um, by Jason Aaron, who have already done so much to build out this like vast world surrounding Thor. Um, I think Downey Cates is going to do even more. Um, he is going to probably pull from some things that have been done in the past. And I expect to see during this series some back issues pop out of nowhere because he will find these minuscule things that have been done by previous writers and find ways to amplify them. Um, at the same point, I think he is going to do some destruction to De Thor's universe because that's just his style. I mean, he is at his core. He's the, he's the rebel of comics. He is the bad boy. He is, um, he's, he considers himself very metal. Um, and you know, with that comes the destruction. Uh, so th this series, I'm very excited to check out and to read. I, what I, you know what I'm most excited about is what is your reaction going to be? How are you going to be? I can't wait, Brian, to talk to you on a monthly basis after these issues come out to see whether or not you are as excited as I anticipate I'm going to be or whether this is going to really piss you off. Um, and that's what's going to be, for me, the most entertaining. Now, we're talking about issue one here, and I know I'm being kind of broad stroke, right? I'm talking about the series. But it, if you look at the way Donny Cates has done issue number ones, I think you got to compare this to Venom because that was the last time Donny Cates took over a series that he was really super passionate about. When he came to Marvel, he wanted to write Venom. And just like the way that he wanted to write Venom, he has been very public about wanting to write Thor. Um, so I imagine he has ideas on deck. The first question that I have is, what is up with that suit, bro? That that new look to to, to Thor. I don't know if I can get down with that. It's like Silver but, Fox Thor. <laughs> right. But they promise in the trailer for this issue um, that's on YouTube right now that they're going to get into that in issue number one. So we'll get that, right? But um, the thing to pay attention to is it, you know, everybody, when they talk about the Venom run, you start talking about Dylan, right? That's the big thing that he added to Venom. That happened in issue seven and nine. So I don't know that you're going to get hit with it right off the bat. Issue number one is going to kind of walk us in. Um, it, it's going to sell a bunch of copies. There's going to be, like you mentioned, a bunch of retailer exclusive variants. But, you know, in, at this point, man, I think Donny Cates has earned our trust as a writer where um, you kind of got to give him the benefit of the doubt. He hasn't messed anything up yet. Yeah, I have no doubt Donny Cates will do a great job. I think part of it is maybe I'm a little selfish because I've liked as great of a job as Jason Aaron's done on that. And anyone that's read it and is a fan of Jason Aaron knows what I'm talking about. I think I'm being selfish because the, f the hotness of Donny Cates brings any attention to the title of Thor. Now my like nice little baby that I've been hiding a secret and enjoying the run on, I think it's going to have a lot of people paying attention to. And it's just one of those things where it's a great thing, but it's like the people that jump onto something later and then they're like, man, Thor's so good. And I'm like, bitch, if you would have read it like last run, you don't even know how good it was or when Walter Simonson was writing it. I mean, you sound like indie rock fans, right? You got this band that you've been loving and then they, they get a hit against, record. And, I'm against the establishment, bro. Right. And suddenly they get a hit record and you're like, no, no, I've been loving them yeah. since 98. You're just new to this. Yeah, we're not, <laughs> we're not on XM, bro. You only find us on SoundCloud. 
Yeah, that's that's what you sound like. But I understand what you mean because Donny Cates is going to bring in a lot of people who probably would never have read Thor um, and never paid attention to. It's going to bring in even like a speculative community that hasn't necessarily paid attention to Thor until Donny Cates started using characters from Thor in his Venom run, you know. Collecting aside, uh, you know, the hotness of books aside, I am genuinely enjoy reading all of his his work with Marvel. I think it's outstanding. So there it is, guys. Those are our 10 picks for comic books that are hitting final order cutoff this coming Monday, November 25th at 10 p.m. Eastern. So make sure you contact your comic book store. Make sure you get your order in online. But 10 p.m. Eastern, that's when those orders are cut off. And like we always do. Jack is here to tell us about the later printings that are hitting FOC as well. Yeah, and Brian, I hope you got some time on your hands because uh, the scrolling graphic that we put for this, it's going to look like a Star Wars intro. I'm just kidding. We've got one book from Boom Studios. Heartbeat number one comes with a second print, and uh, that is the only book this week with a late printing release. But it is kind of an important one, especially the way those Boom second prints have been going. Anxious to see if this one does the same as well. But either way, that's what we have. And if you want to see the full FOC list, we're talking not just comic books, but we're talking about hardcovers, graphic novels, games, toys, cards. That full list you can find right now on SimpleManscomics.com. Yeah, Super 7 New Japan Pro Wrestling figures are on the FOC list this week. Yeah. And with that being said, first, cheers to you guys one last time. I'm Brian Wood. And I'm Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. Remember, buy what you like. That way you'll always be happy with your collection. Sleigh bells ringing, diamonds blinging, carols singing.